Have you ever asked yourself why men have nipples, being that men can't nurse babies? Here on the Matter of Facts channel, we will answer 10 questions you only ask the doctor if you had a few cocktails. What causes morning breath? It turns out that morning breath, aka halitosis, has nothing to do with bacteria or germs, according to some tales. Australians claim that in the middle of the night, when you're asleep, the poo fairy comes and takes a dump in your mouth. In England, they say a long night at the pub leaves your breath tasting like the vulture's dinner. Given all these tales, let's discuss the facts. There are several causes of morning breath, but the two biggest causes are dry mouth, xerostomia, and bad oral hygiene. Anaerobic bacteria in your mouth primarily feed on leftover foods rich in protein, such as meat, fish, or dairy products. The excretions made by the anaerobic bacteria are the major cause of bad breath. These volatile sulfur compounds make the breath smell rotten, which is why these bacteria are called putrefying bacteria. Other things also contribute to this oral smorgasbord. Medications, alcohol, sugar, smoking, caffeine, dairy products, periodontal disease, and gastrointestinal reflux, also known as acid reflux. But don't run off and have your tongue sandblasted. There are simple things that you can do to fight morning breath. Brush regularly and make sure you do not forget the tongue, floss, and drink plenty of water. Have you ever noticed that when someone is yawning, it triggers you to yawn? Why are yawns contagious? I'm so glad burping, drooling, and scratching is not contagious. Now that being said, there are several theories for what causes yawns and why they are contagious. It was originally thought that people yawn to get more oxygen, but this appears not to be true. Experts at the University of Nottingham have published research that suggests that human propensity for contagious yawning is triggered automatically by primitive reflexes in the primary cortex an area of the brain responsible for motor functions. Contagious yawning is triggered involuntarily when we observe another person yawn. It is a common form of echo phenomenon. The automatic imitation of another's words, echolalia, or actions, echoproxia. And surprisingly, it's not just humans who have a propensity for contagious yawning. Chimpanzees and dogs do it too. Echo phenomenon can also be seen in a wide range of clinical conditions linked to increased cortical excitability, and or decrease psychological inhibitions such as epilepsy, dementia, autism, and Tourette syndrome. I think most of us have experienced this. What really is happening when our foot falls asleep? Saturday night palsy is a condition often seen in emergency rooms. It is when your arm or foot falls asleep, but slightly more severe. Saturday night palsy is caused when someone who is very intoxicated and wasted is unable to move an arm or leg in response to the pins and needle feeling, medically known as paresthesia. You may also experience temporary paresthesia when you have your feet in an elevated position, such as legs up on the wall pose. This can lead to temporary or even permanent nerve damage. Now, this is what happens in normal conditions. When pressure is applied on part of your leg or arm, several things occur. Arteries can become compressed, making them unable to provide the tissue and nerve with the oxygen and glucose they need to function properly. Nerve pathways can also become blocked, preventing the normal transmission of electrochemical impulses to the brain. Some of the nerves stop firing, while others fire hyperactively. These signals are sent to the brain, where they are interpreted as burning, prickling, or tingling feelings. It is these sensations, paresthesia, that alert you to move your foot. Shaking your foot releases the pressure, and nutrient-rich blood flows back into the area and nerve cells start firing more regularly. The pins and needle feeling, or paresthesia, can intensify until the nerve cells recover. This is why it's painful when you try to wake up your sleeping limb. Is it true that the tongue is the strongest muscle in the body relative to its size? You could twist it and bend it. You can lick your lips with it. You can do all kinds of aerobics with your tongue, but don't attempt any feats of strength with it. And that is because your tongue isn't the strongest muscle in your body. Unlike your biceps, your tongue is made up of eight muscles that don't grow around a supporting bone. Instead, your tongue develops into a muscular hydrostate structure similar to an elephant's trunk or octopus's tentacles. The heart has also been mentioned, but since it moves involuntarily and is mainly an endurance muscle, it doesn't really get to the heart of the question, no pun intended. The sartorius, which slants across the thigh to the knee, is the longest muscle in the body. So the question is, if the tongue isn't your strongest muscle, then what is? If you define strength by brute force, then the winner is, who's the biggest? Your muscles are bundles of individual fibers. Those fibers contain small force generating structures, sarcomeres. The more sarcomeres the muscle has, the more power it can generate. 
That makes the quadriceps on the front of your thighs and the gluteus maximus of your buttocks the biggest, most powerful muscles of all. Why do men have nipples? Men can't nurse babies, so why on earth do they have nipples? Nipples are a vestige of our early days in the womb. Basically, males and females are all built from the same genetic blueprint. We are all mammals and blessed with body hair, three middle ear bones, and the ability to nourish our young with milk that females produce and modified sweat glands called mammary glands. During the first several weeks, male and female embryos follow the same blueprint, which includes the development of nipples. However, at about six to seven weeks of gestation, a gene on the Y chromosomes induces changes that lead to the development of testes, the organ that makes and stores sperm and produces testosterone. After the testes are formed, the male fetus begin producing testosterone at about nine weeks of gestation, changing the genetic activity of the cell in the genitalia and brain. But by then, those nipples aren't going anywhere. Men are just left with nipples and also some breast tissue. Men can even get breast cancer, and there are some medical conditions that can cause male breasts to enlarge. Abnormal enlargement of the breast in a male is known as gynecomastia. Why do you get bags under your eyes when you're tired? Have you ever wondered why you have bags under your eyes that make you look like Droopy Dog or John Kerry? As any sleep-deprived person with a mirror knows, dark circles under the eyes are usually prominent after a bad night's sleep. The skin around the eyes is the thinnest found anywhere in the body, and this thin skin allows dark venous blood to show through. Genetics is the biggest culprit. Eye bags are generally more noticeable in people who have thin and pale skin. That's because a fair complexion does little to hide what's going on behind the scenes of the face. When people are tired or stressed, blood circulation in the eye area tends to slow, allowing blood to pool there. Capillaries, which are thin blood vessels, stretch and leak, leading to puffy, dark eye circles. Sometimes environmental factors beyond a person's control, including gravity, can cause eye bags. As people age, they lose collagen, which is a structural protein, and elastin, which is an elastic protein found in connective tissue. The bone in the face also lose volume as people age, so everything just hangs off the face, and that contributes to the eye bags too. Why do you have an appendix if you can live without it? The appendix is a small pooch off the large intestine. The wall of the appendix contains lymphatic tissue that is part of the immune system for making antibodies. Removing the appendix doesn't cause any harm because several other areas in the body contain similar tissue, the spleen, lymph nodes, and tonsils. The spleen and the tonsils can also be removed. Almost 9% of all men and 7% of all women would get appendicitis at some point in their lifetime, at least in the US. Like 1 in 100,000 people are born without an appendix, and most never even know it unless they have to have surgery for some other condition. Why do some folks have an Audi belly button and some folks have an any? Any belly buttons are like a little dent in your stomach. Audi belly buttons look like a little knot is sticking out. Is yours an any? or Audi belly button. Most people believe that you had any if the doctor tied a good knot. And if you didn't, you were cursed with that funny looking Audi. Well, there's no knot tying at all. Your belly button is a reminder of the place that once connected you to your mother via umbilical cord. When you're born, the umbilical cord is cut and you have a small piece left called the umbilical stump. One to two weeks after birth, the stump falls off and what remains is your belly button. As a result, your belly button is essentially a scar. Whether it's any or outie depends on how your skin grows as it heals. The way your belly button looks is mostly by chance. It doesn't have anything to do with the size of your stomach or weight, the results of how a doctor or anyone else cut the umbilical cord, the results of how your parents took care of the umbilical stump. Any belly buttons are much more common than Audis. A few exceptions exist though. Babies with certain medical conditions that affect the belly button are more likely to have Audis. Other medical conditions may cause an Audi belly button, such as umbilical hernia, where the abdominal muscle around the belly button don't grow as they should. There's also umbilical granuloma, where extra tissue forms around the belly button stump. Also, there's ascites, which is fluid that accumulates in the peritoneal cavity, often due to a disorder with the kidneys or liver. Hepatose plenomegaly is an enlargement of the liver and spleen. And finally, pregnancy, in which the uterus can cause the belly button to pop outward. When you're really cold, why does your teeth chatter? The body usually maintains a constant temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature, the cells of the body works best. But because of the second law of thermodynamics, which says heat flows from a warm object to a cold object, in other words, you're losing body heat and there's a significant change in temperature. It is sensed by an area of the brain called a hypothalamus. When the body gets too cold, shivering activates the muscles in your body to move to help warm up the body tissue. 
It is possible for your body to crank up heat production by as much as 500% by shivering, but this won't keep you warm very long because sooner or later your shivering muscles get tired. As for the teeth chatter, your jaw twitches and spasms when the muscle contracts and relaxes, which results in your teeth chattering. Why do you laugh when you're tickled? <laughs> Laughter is a complex process that requires the coordination of many muscles throughout the body. Laughing increases blood pressure, heart rates, breathing changes, it reduces levels of certain neurochemicals, and is a potential boost to the immune system. So, overall, it's very good for you. Evolutionary biologists and neuroscientists believe that we laugh when we are tickled because the part of the brain that tells us to laugh when we experience a slight touch, the hypothalamus, which is also the same part that tells us to expect a painful sensation. Laughing when tickled in our sensitive spots, under the arms, near the throat, and under our feet, could be a defensive mechanism. Research suggests that we have evolved to send this signal out to show our submission to an aggressor, to dispel a tense situation and prevent us from getting hurt. Also, laughter is related to making and strengthening human connection, a kind of social signal. Studies have shown that we are 30 times more likely to laugh in social settings than when we are alone. Reports also suggest that the origins of laughter may predate human evolution. I'm not sure if most people know that gorillas laugh like us when they're tickled. And believe it or not, rats laugh when they're tickled too. But they giggle at 50 kilohertz, which is out of our audio range. Hey guys, thank you for watching the video. Please like and subscribe to the Matter of Facts channel for future videos on interesting and awesome facts.